Alrighty, so let's talk a little bit about um, hair texture, how we can determine what the texture of a hair is based on its cross-sectional area or its microscopic appearance. So hair shape and texture. Hairs can be straight, they can be curly, they can be um, kinky curly, which is a really tight coil, depending on the cross-sectional diameter. And what we're looking at is the shape of the hair in cross-section. Um, usually we're looking at something that's rounded, oval, or a crescent moon shape. Now that crescent moon shape is quite exaggerated. And if we were to look at it in reality, it would look something more like this, where we have a flattened edge. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. So by straight hair, we mean hair that is like pin straight, stick straight. We're talking about the natural texture of the hair before any chemical or heat processing. It's very easy, well, not necessarily easy, but it's um, something that is certainly possible to straighten hair chemically or with heat using a flat iron, but that doesn't change the cross-sectional shape of the hair itself, all right? Um, people go out and they get like those keratin treatments and things. That only works on the hair that's outside the scalp. And once that hair continues to grow out, it goes back to its original texture. Alrighty, so this is the cross-sectional shape of three different hairs of three different textures. All right, let's talk about these three for just a moment. So this first one that we're looking at is quite round in shape. Second one we have is a little bit more oval. I'm gonna to refer to this one as number one. Our second one here in the middle. And then our third one has that flattened edge. All right, so this hair would be um, very, very straight, like pin straight. What one typically thinks of as um, the hair that somebody might have if they're a uh, full-blooded Asian or Native American descent. All right. Um, in the middle, we have this oval shape. This would be hair that's wavy or has a little bit of a curl to it. And then our third one would have um, a very extreme curl. I'm going to talk to you about why that happens. If you've ever used at the holidays curling ribbon, like you're wrapping up packages and you have that ribbon that has like little ridges on it and you can run a pair of scissors along it and it curls up, that functions very similarly to what's happening here. This flat edge is like the edge on that ribbon that we've run our scissors along. It makes there be additional tension on that side, which then causes the curl to form in that direction. All right, so this curl would form in a downward direction here. Um, the other thing I wanna point out on these hairs is the density of the melanin. Alrighty, so that's something that you can really only see in cross-sectional shape. If we look at this first hair, we have very, very dense melanin. This area of clearness in the center, that's actually where the medulla is. Here in our second hair, the melanin is much less dense. The majority of it is that phaya melanin, that lighter melanin. Here, the majority of this melanin would be that darker melanin or eumelanin. In our third hair, once again, you can see that central area that's primarily blank, okay? That's where our medulla would be. And in addition, you have very heavy pigmentation to the outside, not quite as heavy on the curved side. Alrighty, so that allows us to know something about the texture of the hair. So this hair would be straight. Hair number two would be wavy to curly. And hair three would be very curly. Alrighty. So that gives you an idea of how we can determine texture based on what we're seeing in the microscope. Um, now, let's go on to talk about other things that we can see in hairs. One of the things that's very evident when you look at a hair underneath the microscope is whether there are any types of damage to that hair. So hair damage can be chemical, it can be heat-based, or it can be mechanical. And we're gonna talk about several different types of this damage, alrighty? 
So heat based damage includes two main things and those are bubbling and burning and I'm going to talk about both of those now. So here in the second hair we see a type of damage called bubbling. All right. Now bubbling happens when you have a hair that has extreme heat damage and usually this forms because hair that was damp was heated to an extreme temperature. I'll give you an example. Maybe somebody was really impatient. They took a shower, their hair was damp, and they decided they wanted to straighten their hair with a hair iron. So they turn the hair iron really high up and they get this creation of steam from the hair as they iron it out. But what happens is there's actually moisture trapped between the keratin fibers of the cortex of that hair. And just like popcorn, when that moisture that's trapped in the keratin gets turned into steam pressure builds and it causes it to expand. And that expansion, just like in a popcorn kernel, makes the popcorn pop, causes the formation of these bubbles. Those bubbles in the hair, you can see another one here, are weak spots. And those are points where that hair is much more likely to break and then fall out. So if we found hair like this at a crime scene that had high levels of bubbling, we would know that somebody that used a lot of heat on their hair. Now, not to be sexist, but oftentimes this tends to be a female who is putting their hair for, through a little bit more torture than many guys do. All right. Burning is pretty straightforward. We've all seen those terrible YouTube videos of somebody burning, literally burning their hair. Um, you can see that in the hair as well. Oops. Didn't mean to go back. There we go. Now, mechanical damage, on the other hand, includes things like cutting, tearing, or stripping of the cuticle. In our top image, this is a cuticle that has been completely stripped. The way that this normally happens is a one-two punch of heat damage causing the cuticle to lift, and then mechanical damage actually ripping the cuticle off of the hair, okay? So, if you get that happening, this is when you think of like 80s hair or New Jersey hair where somebody's back combing the hair, causes those cuticle flakes, those cuticle scales to bend back from the hair itself and eventually they break off. So what you are looking at here in this diagram is actually naked cortex with just a few scales of the cuticle left. Oof, pretty extreme stuff. Alrighty. Now, another type of damage that we're all pretty familiar with is split ends. But have you ever seen a split end under extreme magnification? Looks horrifying. Look at that. It's like cables that have sprung out from a tension bridge. These are all views of split ends. Now, split ends are a classic type of mechanical damage, and it can be made worse by adding heat or chemical treatment to that hair. Now, let's take a look at color treatment in hair. Here we have hair that has been bleached and hair that has been dyed. Now, the reason why bleaching is so damaging to hair is remember where the melanin is in your hair. The melanin is in the cortex and the cortex is hidden under the cuticle. In order to bleach hair, one has to actually get to the melanin and chemically alter it or destroy it. And in order to do that, the, those scales of the, the cuticle have to be lifted up so that the cortex can be accessed. That's one of the reasons why bleaching hair is so damaging. Now, dyeing, on the other hand, oh, and by the way, if you look at this bleached hair, you can see you don't see any pigment granules in there anymore. They're still in there. They've just been chemically broken down. So they no longer have the appearance they once did. Now, if you look in the dyed hair, you can still see some tiny granules of pigmentation in it. However, it has this uniform color throughout. And that's because the dye is kind of overlaid over the top of the existing color. Okay, 
So that's the difference between bleaching and dyeing and why bleaching is so much more damaging to hair because you're lifting all the scales of the cuticle. I don't know why I feel like I have to do that. Um, it allows mechanical and heat damage to also happen much easier. Now let's talk a little bit about the growth cycles of the hair. So hair actually grows in cycles. Um, hair follicles grow in these repeated cycles and one hair cycle can be broken down into three phases. Anagen, catagen, telogen, alrighty. So anagen is considered to be the growth phase of the hair. Catagen is kind of an in-between resting phase and telogen is the death phase of the hair. If we look at this diagram, you can see we start in anagen, we have an active growing follicle and as we go into catagen, that follicle, the hair kind of pulls away from the follicle and the follicle starts to die. As that kind of pull away from the follicle continues, the hair goes into telogen. And once the hair goes into telogen, a new hair will start to grow underneath it in its own antigen phase, which will then push the original hair out. And at that point, you would have a new hair taking its place. And this happens constantly. And the interesting thing is that every hair on your head, I mean, thank goodness, does this independently of one another. All right. Think about how horrifying it would be if all your hairs were on the same cycle. You go walking down the hallway, you get goose pimples up the back of your neck, and then all of a sudden, all of your hair falls out. That would be a nightmare. Now, this is also why people go bald, because if you have a hair that enters into telogen and there's no antigen hair to take its place, well, that's when you've started losing your hair. Now, hair growth can be affected by lots of things. Nutrition, genetics, um, hormones can also affect it. It's one of the reasons why when women go through pregnancy, a lot of times their hair will change. Um, so, there's a lot of things that can affect these growth cycles of your hair. So anagen, once again, is where we're actively growing. This usually lasts for two to six years, and that's also genetic. If you have a short hair growth cycle, that means your hair will never get terribly long. You might know somebody that no matter what they do, they just can't get their hair past their shoulders. And you might also know someone who seems like their hair grows like an inch a month and their hair is down past their butt, okay? They have a longer growth cycle. At any given time, 85% of the hairs on your head are actively in antigen, actively growing. Catagen is the next phase. It's also the shortest phase. It only lasts one to two months. It's a, sorry, one to two weeks. It's a transitional resting phase for that hair before it enters into telogen or the death phase. Now, a telogen hair is one that is actively dying and it's ready to fall out. It usually lasts for five to six weeks. And during that time, that new antigen hair is growing underneath it, getting ready to push it out from the follicle or from the scalp. Now, everybody's hair generally grows about half a millimeter per day or one centimeter per month or approximately half an inch per month or about 10 centimeters to about five and a half inches a year. Not bad. Now, when we look at the root of a hair, this is where the hair growth cycle becomes important because the roots of human hairs look different based on whether that hair was forcibly removed or if it's a telogen hair and naturally fell out. If you've ever woken up in the morning and saw, found hairs on your pillow, or when you brush your hair, there's hairs in the brush, don't get alarmed. Those are just hairs you were gonna eat, lose from telogen anyway, okay? Those were gonna fall out anyhow. You're just helping them along. If we find hairs that have been forcibly removed, where we can see segments of the follicle tissue on them, all right? That tells us something very different. Think for a moment, what would finding a group of hairs that were forcibly removed versus ones that had fallen out, what would that tell us about a crime scene? 
right? If we find a large number of forcibly removed hairs, that means that in general, we have some type of violence that happened at the scene of that crime because hairs don't get ripped out on their own. Now, let's talk a little bit about hair comparison. We're talking about in terms of forensics. When we find hairs at a crime scene and we decide, okay, it's time for us to start examining them. What do we look at? We look at the color of the hair, but remember that can be changed with dyes. We look at the length of the hair. Remember that can be changed by cutting it. We look at the diameter of the hair. That generally won't change no matter what you do to it. We look at the distribution, shape, and color intensity of the pigment granules. And remember, if we have hair that's been dyed, we have color that's in the cuticle and the cortex. Cortex should have color, cuticles shouldn't. So if you see color in the cuticle of the hair, you know that hair has been dyed. We also look and see if we've had any bleaching, see if there's a distinct absence of pigment, because unless someone has albinism, they will have some pigment granules in their hair. By the way, albinism is a complete absence of pigment from any of the body tissues. We also look at the scale types. This is where we get into human versus non-human species. Humans all have that imbricate scale pattern. Other animals or other mammals can have all sorts of different patterns. We look and see if the medulla is present or absent. We'll also look at the type and the pattern of that medulla. And finally, we will look at the medullary index for that hair. Remember, a medullary index of greater than one half is usually an animal. A medullary index of less than one third is usually a human. Now, how are hairs collected from a crime scene? Usually questioned hairs have to be accompanied by an adequate example of control samples, either from a suspect or a victim. So we might also collect hairs from others who might have deposited hair at the scene. If there were a number of people that were living in a certain area and we found lots of hairs there, you might collect hair samples from everyone who lived in that house. Oops, sorry. Now, what is a control sample? A control sample is usually 50 full length hairs taken from random places on the scalp because different areas on the head can have a different hair texture. Me, for example, I have gently wavy, naturally wavy hair, but at the back of my head, like just up from the nape of my neck, it's crazy. I have like one patch of hair, it's about the size of an orange, that's super curly. And oftentimes people have a difference in texture of hair just on different locations on their scalp. You might have that too. Usually they'll also take 25 full length body hairs, which means hairs from the arms, lengths, etc. And that's it for hair analysis today. We're gonna to be looking at a few case studies in hairs and talking a little bit more about their application and the dangers of putting too much stock in hair evidence in some classic FBI cases. Thanks.